Good afternoon. I am very happy to be here. Um, you're invited to give a panel on bowel stuff, which is something easy to make jokes about, but still a serious problem. You know, I don't think they have changed since the panel was here, either as residents or faculty. Um, it's still a big issue for their patients. It's a health issue. It's a dignity issue. It still predicts activity in the community and predicts who goes home. And for those who don't have satisfactory bowel programs, they have the extra burden of dealing with that. So um, I'll introduce the, our other panelists today. This is Dr. Fred Maynard, uh, who now lives in Marquette. So hence, he's Dr. Euper uh, these days. And Lance Getz over there. He was a resident here, and now he's a faculty at uh, in, in the VA system. Okay. Okay. And, you know, Tony Kyoto will, will help us out if we get stuck with that. So, go with that. Uh, can I just get a sense of who's here? How many residents we have here? Raise your hands. A few. Okay. Residents, not yet. I, I'll save you guys the best for last with that. Okay. Uh, therapist. Okay. Nurses. Okay. And other. Okay. <laughs> what are others? Are you guys with the grant? Okay. Well, that's first step. So this is real open-ended. Uh, if there's a special topic you want us to cover, speak up or speak up later. Otherwise, I thought just get started uh, to give an update on a couple new things out there in terms of bowel management. So if you guys think of specific topics, just chime in here when I get done with this part of the talk here. Okay, where's where's the down button here? Huh? Okay. So something new is a percutaneous colostomy, uh, um, which is put into the cecum. Of, and actually, this is not a new deal. Uh, the the peds we have right from the peds world here. No. Okay. Um, the the concept with this is that you can put fluid in the cecum. And basically, you have normal flow, um, kind of a natural sort of process. Uh, in effect, you're given an anti-grade enema with this. Again, this mimics normal flow. And surgical created cecostomies have been around for, for probably 20 years with the pediatric populations, especially spina bifida, and they have worked well. And what's new with the adults is our GI doctors have said that if they can put in PEG tubes endoscopically, why they why can't they use the same techniques to put in a uh, secostomy? So, and this is really simple once the tube's in, because the enema is plain water. Uh, the peds world, they were using things with, with minerals in it and things, electrolytes, and it's really not needed. And the beauty of using water is that the bowel normal functions to absorb water, so whatever does go through you, you just absorb it. And uh, the concept is that this can really improve bowel programs for people. Uh, since it mimics normal bowel movements, it might be faster. You do it on a toilet, um, and it might be more reliable. And, of course, that might uh, reduce the help needed for, for bowel care and hopefully also improve continence with this. And the, the twist with this is that they're using a regular gastrostomy tube, percutaneous tube. So, and this is an ongoing study at the VA in Milwaukee, uh, and they have gotten uh, approval through the IRBs and the FDA to, uh, to study 25 patients with this. I think there, there are about 10 patients through the study right now. And, uh, it, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, Denise. So, With that, uh, it varies from minutes to half an hour. Yeah, yeah. And and the, the nice thing about this for adults uh, is that it's a simple procedure. It's not major surgery to perform this. And uh, this is looking at a patient. So this will be the cecum appendix here, and uh, a, a uh, endoscope is placed, and they find the cecum uh, through the skin. They'll make a puncture, and they'll feed a wire up uh, at this point, and then that, that's pulled through, and then the uh, 
the, the tube is attached and that's pulled out. Oops. And this is your standard peg tube, okay? And it has this button that's in the inside, and then you have some sort of fastener to keep the skin taut while things heal up. So this is uh, uh, pictures of somebody newly placed. It looks like any other peg tube with this. And then they can start, and then they have some sort of device again to hold the skin layers with this. And the risks are going to be the same as with a peg tube. Uh, uh, air in the perineum, peritonitis is obviously the major concern with this procedure. And then as the things heal up, they can uh, cut the tube and they can place uh, a little button. So in effect, this is what you end up, just something flat against the skin. So now for, if you see a patient who's had a surgical cecostomy, it looks like a little dimple. It looks like just like the, the uh, the ostomies they make for, for casting with reconstruction, the bladders and stuff like that. So, so um, I've only had one patient on not the VA side. I know how she got it done, uh, but she's out with the, uh, civilians, and she loves it. She gets out of the toilet. She does it by herself. Again, there's no special equipment. She uses a regular, just the same catheter she used to cath with to, to put in the tube. She runs in uh, uh, 500 to 1,000 milliliters cleans out, and it empties the whole colon, a large colon. So this is something I think uh, if they can prove it's safe to do, you'll, you'll be having this as a nice oh, option. Uh, she, she, I think she was doing it every, every two days. Yeah. And she was a para longstanding. And I haven't seen many papers in this. Lance, I, I know if you've heard much about aging, aging colons. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, the first I wanted to. The one question I had for the group was, how many of you are actually familiar with the anti-grade continence enema or the ACE that was used in the spina bifida kids? I know you are, Tony, but in the audience, did you know about that? So, so the so that the the difference is that is was that they typically used the the um, appendix, and they would bring the appendix to the abdominal wall and create a little button that was like a stoma, a very small stoma, that then a person could put, you know, uh, a, a fully type tube and flush. So this is, this you could do on somebody who even they don't have an appendix. Um, but that's, that's one of the differences. And I guess, you know, that's, that would be a more, doing the, the appendiceal procedure would be a more involved procedure, mm -hmm. obviously. It would be major surgery. Yeah. I don't think you're supposed to do that. You know, even the folks who have upper motor neuron SCI start to look like a lower motor neuron after about 30 years of spinal cord injury from having chronic obstipation, dilatation of their gut, and um, and the gut is just at the end of its starling curve. It doesn't respond, I guess, and, and it's chronically dilated. So those folks don't respond very well. And so these old veterans are, are a good population to test this. Yeah. 
and I think we've all had a GA doctor diagnose megacolon yeah. from the long-standing smyopoid injuries. But the, the bowel just gets tortuous, elongated, it's dilated to start with, and it just doesn't create peristalsis enough to really remove that stuff. And, and even manual removal, you just can't, I don't think anybody has a finger long enough to really help these people out and stuff like that. So, so on the, and this will be an upcoming thing. I think you'll hear more about it because it is a simple procedure. Uh, and we just need to convince the FDA that it's, it's safe enough, so, yeah? So patients who, who have an upper motor neuron GI tract, you may have the megacolon situation where obviously the colon itself versus the sigmoid is incompetent, but they still may have a spastic crinkle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is this a problem for those patients? Um, I don't know. Good question. So they are combined it with uh, uh, might have to take your evacuation. Because a ditch or a ditch stretch, really. Yeah, just a stretch that right. post stretch posteriorly opens up, as opposed to even having skin. The problem would be if they're, if they're highly dyslexic, right? Maybe some sentence to see where it could get restricted. Super surgeon gravity, right? Hmm? Super surgeon gravity, which is right. Uh, yeah, but the the the, the, the typical bolus of flu they use is. Uh, no, because uh, again, the, the 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 colon still absorbs well, even though it might be dilated. So, so, so it, it's when it works well, it, it's good. So. Uh, this is a percutaneous uh, colostomy. I mean, per percutaneous secostomy. Secostomy. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's a peg, except you're. Put it somewhere else you know, on the stomach. So we also put the tube in the other end to start with, or at least I hope you are. So, so any question about this? So, yes. Would they like? I know it's still looking at. But would they do it with newly injured people, or would they wait for a while? Like uh, I don't think this would be a newly injured. So like how long out before? Except twelve months, I bet, if it gets approved and stuff like that. Because for us, for us, we've already taken care of lots of bowels. Most people do fine. They get a program, it works well, they're happy with it. Uh, they don't have many accidents, so that works well. But there's anywhere from 10 to 20% of people that just ain't happy. And, and typically, at least early, it's the lower motor neuron folks who, who uh, have the most problems because uh, they just don't empty out well and they just sort of, sort of get stuck. And those are usually the most unhappy campers. Yes? My name is Paula Anton. And I'm a clinical nurse uh, specialist on the unit. And my question is, when we're teaching patients about this as a future possibility, um, and patients are saying it takes so long to do the bowel program, is there any idea how long this takes? It, it, it doesn't take long. Average? No, it, it, it how takes. How long they have to stay on the toilet, maybe? Uh, usually most, most uh, I have, actually I have more experience with the, with the swine bifid kids, because we've had a transition program uh, but with, with this, what I've heard is anywhere from, from five minutes to 30 minutes. Five oh. to 30 minutes. Yeah. Uh -huh. That would be yeah. maybe once or twice a week. Uh, it's just like any bowel program. You've got to figure out how often you're going to do it and stuff. But one of the beauties, <coughs> beauties with this with the lower maw neuron folks is that you're, you're distending part of the bowel that should still have relatively normal innervation, at least so you still have some peristalsis. And typically, patients will they often will sense this work. How long do you think the radiation treatment may be stronger than the spine bifida? The spine bifida? I want to guess 20 years. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. One year? Yeah. 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 I'm sorry about the ACE when I was a, uh, you know, when I was a resident. Yeah. No, we've transitioned about 50 young adults over, and we've not had any GI population. Probably have them have had this stuff. And interesting enough, it's the urologists who have been doing this procedure. Because yeah. they're going there and do what they got to do with the bladder too and stuff. But especially, I wish Jenny was here also to help out with the peds question. But 
the pediatric urologist is very, very tuned in to the bowel stuff, how it affects the bladder. Because you've got a big, hard, constipated stools down low, it's fine, it's also not what obstruction of the bladder causes that go through the bathroom. Okay, well that's the percutaneous, per, percutaneous succostomy tube. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, I think we need to move the computer off around here a little bit now. Uh, I, I need to let you know I'm not a paid spokesman for coloplast. Uh, we'll see. Okay. And actually, I heard about this device. It's, it's a device for transanal irrigation. Okay. And like a lot of things, it's not new. And like a lot of innovative things, it's been used in the peace world for a long time. Uh, they've not had a system. Uh, but they, there's a elastic plug you can buy, wash, reuse, and they jury rig IVs and things like that. Uh, so it basically that allows you to give a, a water enema to somebody who can't retain an enema otherwise. So the coloplast is based in Denmark, right? <laughs> Danish. And uh, <coughs> they came out with this system, I think, 10 years ago. And I first heard about it during an international spinal cord meeting in Iceland in 2007, yeah. yeah. And I've been bugging the cold class folks here since then about bringing this over, and they finally decided to work on it. Um, they had it approved end of last year, and they decided to redesign a catheter, so it has to be approved again. So we can expect this to be approved for use sometime later this year. And they really want centers to get people trained to teach patients how to use this. So, but uh, this is the whole kit, and when I talk to our pe people about this, they're like, this is cool, just how, how, how nice it is in size, what you carry around, and I'll show you the system. And it's actually, it, it's pretty well, it's well thought out. There's two, two size catheters. These are rectal catheters with a balloon, so it's an adult size. This is one for, for children. Yeah. This is peristine is the whole system. Yeah. So this is a transanal irrigation system. So as long as nobody opens these up, I can pass these around. Mm -hmm. that. And the kit involves the catheters. And then... So uh-huh. Yep, and I'll, I'll show you how that what that looks like. It's very soft and it's silicone. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's latex free. So you have a little bag that folds up. You put put this in here. Then you have connecting tubes. Then you the, the control device is quite large, so it's halfway designed for quads. They also have a have a strap for this so you can attach it your thigh, so and this is all designed to be used sitting on the toilet. So, do to do. to this and other, an, another form of bowel care and um, so the the results the results were that folks preferred it and they reported uh, um, better results of their bowel care I don't remember if it was shorter times or if just they were generally more happy uh, actually there's a nurse researcher PhD named Cosgrove and she's published a lot of she's in England yeah and uh, she's uh, readily available to to you know Well, 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 I'm not quite there yet. So, so the catheters, the bag, you open up a little bit, connect it, and there's a little stick em spot here. So you can stick that the wall next to you in the bathroom. Right, like that, okay. Oh, I hope nothing blows up this time. <laughs> Yeah, and so the group, again, the group of people that were selected for the study in Europe were 
they weren't new injuries by and large. They were people with very chronic SCI who were having problems. Yeah. No, they were adults. And the typical amount of water is between 500 and 700 cc's. Let's see if I can not spill too much. Uh, let's see. Again, this is you, you just use tap water. You might want to get it, you know, tepid, you know, nothing hot, not too hot, not too cold. And that's a hydrophilic catheter. And you Give a squirt. So, so you fill up the plastic, so now we'll wet the hydrophilic part, so now it's nice and slippery. So, again, this is a pretty well thought out system, and, and uh, yeah, so this is should be nice and slimy now. It should enter easily. Okay. Then you throw. Turn the dial, and now you pump up the balloon. Okay. And part of the uh, the training with this is to teach the patient through how many pumps they need to, to, to fill it out. Now I did talk to some of her friends in Europe. I I talked to Tim about this, and there's still a few people this won't stay in, but for the most part works well. So you fill up the balloon, then you turn the dial again. Oh, whoops. No, it's, just, it's all over again. There we go. And if this is nice and tight, then you fill up the predetermined amount of fluid in there, again, between 500 and 700 cc's. Okay. And you don't wait. It's not like an enema where you have to wait forever. You fill it up, and then you you deplate that. This will usually just fall out of the person. And this is not to wash out the stool, but that much of a bolus will, will distend not just the rectum, but part of the descending colon. And that stimulates the bowel movement then. Okay? So... Yeah. No, 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 no. It's all, it's all, it's all delivered by pumps. It's, it's pumps. Yeah, the, the jury rig system that Pete's people have used, uh, they hang bags and tubes and things like, yeah, like that sort of stuff. So the, it's, and it's become very popular in Europe, and people use it. I think almost every rehab center is using it. They have a different reimbursement system, as we all know, uh, so money's not an issue. Uh, the big problem with this system is going to be those catheters. It, well, again, I didn't work for the company, but, I'll, but, but many of my patients have asked, well, why can't I just wash and reuse it? And the answer is, don't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah. Is it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <coughs> yeah. And again, it all flows in the bag. The feedback I got from, again, the Pete's world, they said it's just for a nice out of one little package. You can travel with this and take care of things. The company, at first, their price point for these things was, was between $10 and $15 a piece. Oh. For the catheter? For the catheter? Yeah, everything else, in theory, it should all last at least six months or longer. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Well, well, yeah. As far as far as the the the, uh, the, the fluid bolus, yeah. yeah. But then again, that stimulates up higher where we can't reach with our 
claspers of fingers. And they talk about training with this also. That might take up to six months to get used to things. They also have sort of reports that people don't have to use this after a while. The bowels get trained. And that's been a concept from the get go with bowel management. We used to call it bowel training. Doing the bowel program every day, eating after a meal. The old days is go ahead and eat, have a cigarette, go do your bowel program. You know, to take, take advantage of all these other stimuluses for the bowel, but also get her bowels used to doing the program every day. So this is transanal irrigation. Cold class is making it. I'm not a paid spokesman, but it looks like it's a good deal. And at least the patients I've talked to, it's those lower molar neuron patients, the older spinal cord patients who just their bowels are pooping out, so to speak. Well, they're not pooping out. Though. <laughs> so, <laughs> so again, coloplast, the FDA wants to have, have trained trainers to, to do this too. So, And me and a nurse at the San Diego VA are the two American people who bug and coloplast. So they're going to start with our centers to start teaching uh, with that. And have you heard much of it in the VA system? Well, we, again, we haven't had access. Yeah. When I was in Dallas, the rep actually. Yeah. So, um, <coughs> and haven't had anybody from the university. Yeah. The good news is that uh, class said the first few people who want to volunteer <coughs> will get free supplies for a year. Mm -hmm. so, so, I think you hear more about it. But there, there, there's a fair amount of stuff in literature in the European, uh, from Europe about this stuff, and it appears to be safe. The major complications they've had is with, with people who never should use the system to start with. People with history of radiation treatments for their gut, uh, people with acute colitis, mm -hmm. uh, people with previous GI surgeries. But other than that, they said they had not had a perforation, which is a major concern with a system like this uh, with an otherwise normal bowel. And again, the literature supports at least the patient endpoint. They're quite happy with the system. I think it's cleaner. It also makes it do in the toilet. So it's just going to be, you know, just a this guy alone will increase uh, the speed of cleanup. Okay. Any, any questions about the system? Well, I just kind of wondered if insurance will cover this. That's going to be the the thousand dollar or more question. <laughs> yeah. Not until FDA is doing yeah. it. Yeah. I suspect the VA might fund it because it, it really is a nice option for uh, bowels that just don't respond to the normal programming and management. Uh, and I think it's an, another option from a psychostomy, which is procedure and has some other risk with that too. Uh, workers' comp, I'm sure, will pay for it. So have Michigan no fall insurance here? So far. Yeah. 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 Trying to repeal it again? The key with the VA is that they get that, you know, they have a successful trial and they get it on the national center. Trouble is getting past that first step. Once you get past that first step, yeah. Could you envision the acute uh, rehab unit in patients who were spinal shock for your health? Well, that was that was one of their contraindications. Mm -hmm. And I said, What are you talking about? Uh, tell me how you can tell when you're out of spinal shock. So, so they him and Paul about that. So but they, I think the the uh, the uh, recommendation at this point, if you wise, is they, they don't want to do it with people too early. It just makes sense to them. They don't want to get people hooked up with a more expensive system early when they might not be there in a month or so later. So uh, I think one of the, of the challenges we have now, except for the VA, that it's a month or two in the hospital is not long enough to come on spinal shock to the especially with all the other so it's a real challenge how to help those people manage things. And even when they're on rehab, they're on antibiotics for this or that, or they got C. diff, and it's just, just a real, real tough to manage. So, luckily, in, in, in our, our spinal cord program in Milwaukee, most of our patients come back to see us. We know we can manage here, and they should be deal with. And we have outpatient nurse case managers slash nurse educators. And we have a capacity to see everybody two weeks after discharge. Month, month, another six months after that. So, 
would put a catheter at night, for a straight catheter, and just take it through the legs and, and hook up to a bag. And actually, Susan Flynn, one of the very old patients here for a long time, taught us that. She was a very independent gal and didn't have a lot of funding. Um, and she got help twice a day, and because of that, she could uh, live in her own place and manage it all at night and during the day. Like a lot with the uh, high injuries, she pretty spaced her fluids, so she wanted to come cat once or twice a day. So that kept her in any kind of a situation. But uh, one, one of the, the bladder supply companies, they have this little bag with a tube, and I said, you know, we do a study with this to give people the tape to the legs. Because the concept with that, why that saves them the whole catheter, is a smaller tube, there's no balloon, so any sort of uh, pressure tug on the, on the tube, the tube pops out without traumatizing. Um, and they were ready to give me cases of this stuff to their lawyers and look at it and said, no. It's never been studied to sit inside a body for more than five minutes. So, so that's when you get all these legal issues that repeat some good ideas and stuff. But, but and the other, and but the companies have to then have to have a product they think they're selling enough to make up the cost of it. You know, and that's their system, love their labor, but that's the way it is right now. So, so but at least both classes jumped the gun. And this company's kind of interesting. It was uh, started by a nurse who her sister had Crohn's disease or something, and she sort of had to make up these, these things and stuff. And the company, although it's a, it's a for profit company, has always had that attitude of helping things out. They actually do a fair amount of money away. They fund on most companies we go to and things like that. So, so uh, I'm not sure if this is from how their heart they decided to try this, this approved over here, but uh, I hope it does go over. They sell a lot of stuff, so the price will be down for these catheters because that's good. Any questions about the transanal irrigation or the pure pain syncostomy? There, there's a, a similar product that um, you've been using a comb irrigator a yeah. lot that yeah. Yeah, you know, the same kind of principle. I don't know if it was, it was called the stomice irrigator. So I don't know if yeah. it's no, no, I mentioned that. The, the oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 They've been doing stuff like this, and it's a plastic plug, which you can buy. But all the tubing stuff is sort of irrigated. When I asked my page people to look at this system, that was their comment. It's really, really small. Small contained, small, you don't have to mess around with all this crazy stuff. So, so you can still do this, and then you have to, so on your own, get all the supplies and stuff. So I was interested, I have the list of how to get that stuff. Uh, there's like a kit to irrigate things, and, and I think it is for stomas, but people, these will have used this for about it's a stone irrigation kit. Well, the, the, the product, the cone stoma irrigator. Um, yeah. So it's the same by just holding the cone in place rather than the balloon suspending it in there. Right. So, so if you can 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 this elastic cone, you can hold through it. So you yeah. can put it yeah. in it. Yeah. 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 So you need to pop it in there. So, that's what about. Any questions about this stuff? OK, we'll open up. Any questions? Topics you know, are experts to discuss. Yes, you, you mentioned the, uh, the transitioning the, the children's spina bifida to an adult uh, adult setting. Mm -hmm. um, just thinking some way up in the hospital right now. It's about 30 years old spina bifida. Mm -hmm. and years of inadequately managed bowel students. Mm -hmm. um, it really at the point where it looks like ileostomy is heading down that path. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious how. Often you see that if, if you're picking up new adult, new to you patients, adults with spina bifida, uh, how often it's, 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 the current generation is very different than anybody over 25. Uh, most most of the, the younger spina bifida have had uh, the benefit of going to the spina bifida clinic. The spina bifida association is very very active. The camp for parents and kids. And the, uh, typically, they're managed with these large multidisciplinary clinics. Mm -hmm. So I would go there. There's no surgery there. 90% of the spine bifida still have shunts placed. A urologist, a uh, orthopedist, a physiatrist, a therapist, a school person, and a nurse. And they all see these kids once a year. And uh, uh, 
when we first discussed the transition program for children, they went, oh, you're going to do what we do. And I went, no. I, I'm not going to get my neurosurgeon to sit around and see three kids in the whole day. And plus, the adult model is different. And as an adult, you have a primary care doctor, there you see them once a year, you get a checkup, and, but it's your job to get sick to come and see them. And, and I was warned about this with this population that they tend to be very passive, and act like they've been in institutions, and that's from their hydrocephalus. But then again, a lot of these find that is, since they get shunned so early, they have pretty intact or normal cognition, they go to college and get jobs. Mm -hmm. So I, I think this is part of the story. And for us who dealt with kids who've grown up to be adults with disabilities, often the big disability is not having a normal childhood. Because as much as our parents loved us, protected us, and taught us what's right, we tend to be the best when we screw them. And for kids with disabilities, parents protect them, and they're on their own, and they just are not able to make decisions because they never done them. And that's been, I remember when I was a resident of Fred, we had a spine with the kid, Dan Mikowski. And uh, we just were hitting our heads against the wall. You know, the therapist kept saying, no carryover, no carryover. How are you doing? Fine. You know, you learn stuff, yes. But, you know, one, one year out the other, or one year out the shunt. You know, that sort of stuff. So, so they're very, very challenging. I have a girl right now who's 40, getting skin problems, she's uh, uh, kind of bowel. And she, yeah, you know, I do bowel for a room as a home for my parents. And she's not chubby, she doesn't transfer anymore, and she's really at risk to get major sores and she goes into the pants and stuff. And the, my, my OT has been working with her, and we're very frustrated with her low strain dressing, so we might ask her, what's the last time you addressed yourself down there or something like that? Would. So, four year old person, you're trying to teach how to put your pants on and stuff like that. So. But, but they, they have the same problem that the patients found for traumatic people. Their bowels get stretched out and get problematic. And the class can give me an option for that. Yeah, well, I was just thinking that this option, I think, would be quite difficult to use because it, it is still tricky. Yeah. I mean, you have to switch these products. For the, the perceptual problems and the learning problems, right? they probably do better with your base system, which yeah. has, been, think, has been used more. Maybe, and if that doesn't work, then yeah. 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 Yesterday, I had a guy come in, and he, well, he came in on Monday, and he took me uh, him for a colonoscopy from yesterday. And, uh, and he called me. The guy's only 62. He's smaller than I am. Thin guy. You wouldn't think that he would have, he's never had abdominal surgery. But they, the, they called me from the endoscopy lab and said, you know, uh, A, he wasn't cleaned out. Thought he was, but the issue that surprised me was here's a, here's a small person who's um, been injured since the 78, but they couldn't pass the scope because he had such redundant loops and he had adhesion, they could not do that. So I could see how you know, we wouldn't necessarily be able to uh, endoscopically yeah, pass something thing like this. Yeah. And I was surprised because, you know, I guess the only factor that made sense was just that he'd been injured since 1978. But, you know, I didn't think of him as a person that I would expect to have, you know, a, a big belly, a, you know, spine, or, you know, and have dilated bowel, something like that. So, so they sure. called you about wanting to do a colostomy? No, no, they, to do it, this whole rectal scan was they just had to do CT colonography. Oh, well, CT just for their screen. They had to do CT colonography instead. They couldn't scope it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, but to get back to your question, uh, like the case grab now, um, the nurses are doing a little more in her own program twice a day. She can't get help twice a day in her department. And I was working well until somebody thought she had cellulitis and an antibiotics, so <laughs> we're messing with that and stuff. So I'm hoping that works for her. Otherwise, um, she'll probably make colostomy. Uh, she, she has a ileostomy ready, so she's used to end of the day. But uh, uh, one of my hopes for us in Smart Road Injury, you know, the long topic here is, you know, with our expertise to take care of bowel bladder skin, specialty pain, equipment, the psychosocial things, you know, we can take care of a lot of other disabilities. 
And for us, we're interested in really providing more than just rehab, providing really long-term care. The more patients we have, the more resources we have, the more we can really be a true primary care environment where people can be seen as needed by the end of the week. Yes? Yeah, and just thinking, I think talking to about Andre Kotsikoff. Yeah. And I was thinking, is this procedure something that actually can cause an autonomic perspective? Uh, that would be one, one question. I don't see how it could. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if they studied this yeah. enough to see if there is uh, any I mean, He's not looking a lot about this and stuff. Now, a lot of the top of Andre. Uh, he's a, a PhD, MD researcher in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And uh, his his passion in life is a long time. And for us in Asia and also it's an international group, we're trying to make that more of a topic because it's been kind of ignored. When you all do the, the Asia exam or ISKI exam, you know, you check what home and that's it. You're not checking anything else about bladder, sexual function, but really a real body life issue. So there's an effort to create some autonomic standards, just like the standards for the, the other Middle Park exam. That's on the Asia website, the international website. Uh, Asia has an e-learning center now. It's just kind of the Asia website, put in education, it's free. You just have to register. Thanks to Dr. Larry. There, there, there's a course, uh, the course on the sniper exam, module five, five or three, the senior rectal exam. And we, we made a special module for that because we realized historically, you know, that we're supposed to do the rectal exam, and there's been never been instructions how to do it, what to look for. So and that's not based on any science or research. It was consensus what people should do. Now, for autonomic stuff, there's an A-step course, autonomic standards, uh, teaching and learning program. <coughs> and the first part is pretty in-depth. It's not an easy part for us to take, but we do the whole autonomic nervous system spot. The second part is an introduction to the autonomic standards. There's also a uh, international data set, uh, and that's you can find that in both the Asia and ISCAS website, and there's different sections, and there's a section on the <coughs> bladder, and there's recommendations for how to chart things with that set. Yeah, well, there, so for the bladder, I mean, the bladder they have it, um, the urinary tract data set, they have a uh, testing data set, and then the one that I'm working on is the um, urinary tract detection data set, which we just submitted. Um, but for the valve, they have CCs, um, and of course, the, the main lead person is, uh, is Dr. Jerry Swartz, who's been involved in all the data sets from Denmark. I um, think Andre was involved with the follow he was involved, yes. uh, well, he was involved with autonomic. Inter for cash, maybe the valve. Inter for cash and Steve Steen and uh, and uh, then were involved with the, there was a valve base and data set and then an extension data set. And the whole point, as I understand, behind these data sets is um, to get people to document the same way. Mm -hmm. so, oh, sure. Um, a big point, uh, so the, the international data sets are something that they want people all over to use so that people will do, be documenting things the same way, same way, documenting the same parameters, and they can be used for, uh, so we're gathering the same in, information, and that helps us uh, from a research perspective. And uh, NIH has, um, I don't want to say endorsed, but as I understand it, um, the 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 NIH folks are the, under the, um, is it NIDR? Yeah, NINDS. Yeah, so they're going to they're gonna crosswalk that so that when people want to get grant funding, they will encourage them to use those elements. And uh, so that's helpful. So the Europeans and us can all get on the same page, too. Or all over the world, really. And I sort of, I'm challenging my nursing staff to jump in there because you guys take care of both ends of any bowel issues. And you guys know what works and doesn't work and stuff like that. So, um, any other topics?
Questions? much shorter than it used to be, we're, we're probably sending the patients home still in spinal shock. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. do you have strategies? I mean, they're going home and their bowel program is not set. Okay. Yes, indeed. Actually, yeah, I have a, something to look at. <laughs> Sonia brought it up. Is all hooked up here? Okay, so we talked about what's new, so what's old? This is what I was, I learned here from Carolina now. <laughs> okay, standard, I think it's still a lot, a lot of how to do papers on, on, on the bowel program. They start with daily stool softers, laxatives, do a suppository, you check the bottom, do a little deep stand and see what happens. Okay. If nothing comes out, it's there, you may have to move it. You're going to do, adjust the medications to reduce the form stool that's ready to be either removed or evacuated and adjust the frequency of the bowel program to avoid accidents, maximize patient comfort, and eliminate uneven bowel problems. So, kind of like save your pants, so to speak, time, and that's assumed they stay here long enough so you see what happens. Okay. Another old way of looking at this, I suppose it's starting the same way with everybody, is trying to decide who's going to be an upper or lower motor neuron, and this has to do where the spinal cord injury is, and what's working below it in the spinal cord. And the A-step course talks a lot about this. And some people want to change the terminology and call this superponal polyplina instead of upper and lower neuron things with that. But the concept with this is when there's no reflex activity in the lower rectum and an anus, and if you say colon, well, it's not to respond to any sort of stimulation that the anus left or above it. So you got to basically take the gut for these injuries. And just to review the anatomy, most of the guts are supplied by the vagus nerve, except uh, you can have the spleen flexure and for the uh, uh, bladder and that So everything else still has some nerve supply from the brain, and the bowel has its own nerves too. Remember those? Our back plexuses and myosin plexuses and anatomy. So it has some other supplies, has its own hormones, and it's always something working. So at least for evacuation, that takes organ muscle too. So when somebody's going to have a low lumbar neuron bowel, again, this just refers to the anus, the rectum, the and colon, you need still to have oral meds as needed because you still have to get the stool formed and at the back door. Uh, you tend to want to have it more firm than, than soft because they don't have any sphincter uh, uh, tone, so I think it's also going to lose out. It's something hard and actually might stay there in there for a while. And you do rectal checks, something's there, you can pull it out, you can do that as often as you need to not have accidents. And this would be once a day, or three after every meal. You do what you need to do. Now, the nice thing about this from a nursing standpoint, is if this is what you do, you don't spend all day in the toilet. You go in there, you check, nothing's there, you see Check it later, tell them go ahead, go to therapy, go to OT or wherever they're doing and stuff. Now, the, the other bowel is the upper lower neuron. Again, this is where you have anal rectal reflex, especially something called the uh, rectal colic reflex. When the rectum is stimulated, dilated, that increases peristalsis from above and still comes down. And that's why those programs can take a while once you start stimulations. You still need to have oral meds, but now you tend to have a stool softer than hard. If the stool that goes through you, the best is a soft form stool. And use the palatories, use the stimulation to, to trigger the peristalsis and the evacuation. And for these programs, you may, you may be doing anywhere from once a day to every two or three days, sometimes even longer. So we have to wait. If this program takes longer, we often have to do it less. So if you had a good crystal ball to figure out which group somebody's in, you do well. Some of the uh, literature talks about T10 being the magic level. Mm -hmm. People above T10 have an upper lower neuron bowel. People below have a lower. Spinal shock can make this confusing, and that's not a hard and fast rule. You, know, you can have injuries way above T10 and still have the whole low spinal cord infarcted, not working. So this won't really 
help that much with that. So we still end up, you know, with the bottom thing here. We still need to confirm what's up in one neuron. We do by exam. This is where the research, I think, really needs to be done. There's a little data that tells what kind of findings really diagnose an upper or lower neuron bowel, or what techniques can validate it. And you know, there's not a lot of data to tell us about these people starting to be clean. We'll have some people with upper lower neuron bowel, you tickle them, they go in two seconds. Other people spend two hours in time. And some people have really risk reflexes, and some people have just traces. So it's we kind of have the assumption that any upper lower neuron reflex that S45 is a diagnostic for an upper lower neuron. Nobody's proven that, nobody studied that. And even, again, this exam part is just what we put in the, the spinal cord course is just what we kind of with. Um, actually, since then, uh, John Steves from Vancouver with the Europeans published some data that that. S1 function parallels S4 by function. That's the new from the old days, but yeah, but that sort of stuff. But we, we check for Babinski's, we ankle clonus, tone, we, we check sensation on S, S1 and S5, we do deep anal pressure, and that's that, and we actually we spend an argument defining what that is, because before that it was vague. And actually there's a paper out there that said deep anal sensation was a cerebral event, not a spinal cord event. So, but we try to, to change the protocol so people just test at S45. So the re recommendation for that now is to uh, just use your finger in the rectum, thumb across the anus and just squeeze left and right. So you're not sticking your whole finger in there, wiggling things around. But I think in those cases, since most of the gut still has its vaguest innervation from the brain, you, you, you're too vigorous. People will sense that. And also, if that sets off any dysreflexia, any spasms, they'll, they'll check that. So we try to, to really hone that down to what's going on. And then the other thing is voluntary versus involuntary rectal tone. Uh, that tends to be still a big, big problem to learn. You need to check a lot of normal butts to know what normal is. And one of the key things to separate voluntary from involuntary rectal tone is usually if it's voluntary, the person can sustain it. While it's a reflex, it's going to be a, a you know, squeeze release. So uh, if you're just seeing a lot of just intermittent squeezing, that might be involuntary tone or just a false positive finding of that. Now, some anal rectal reflexes people check as an anal wink, a little pin, you poke a centimeter or two. Uh, outside of the the, uh, the anus, and you should see a brisk contraction on the outside. And there's left and right sides of this. Um, there's a bulb of cavernosis, where you squeeze the glands in the male, or if it's accessible in the female, you squeeze the uh, clitoris, and you feel for a involuntary contraction. But at least there's some research with that with normals, and that's not present all normals to start with either. There's a, the, the, now the next three are just not, not made up. The things that a lot of people have used over the years that really have not Bill, been written I about. Made a comment about the BCR. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I totally agree, and that's and you and that's a very good point for people to understand that you don't always find the BCR. I guess the other thing I would say about the BCR is even within an individual, there's a lot of variability um, uh, from day to day, uh, week to week um, in their BCR. Um, that I've observed, and um, and I and I um, wonder if it. I don't know, but I wonder if it fluctuates uh, based upon just ear, you know, the degree of spasticity. You know, we know spasticity fluctuates um, as well in people. And um, in my own experience, you know, my spasticity and those reflexes vary a lot depending on what's going on. Is my bladder happy? Is the bowel happy? Other things like that. Yeah. So, and it, it's complicated. And again, I agree with Phil. It, it, it can act like skeletal spasticity, because that can vary day to day with patients. And you have some of the same injury level, same degree of completeness, and one guy will be spasming out of his wheelchair, and the next person is just almost spasming with that. So, and you can also uh, extinguish these reflexes if you do them often enough, quick enough. 
So especially for the residents, if you think you find it and then the professor checks and it's not there, you might tell them, why don't you just wake up and let's do it again. Let's check it again. They might come back and tell. Uh, the finger wiggle test is with your finger in the anus. Just wiggling it quickly and see if you feel a reflex and traction. The Foley tug is just what it describes. You have a finger in the rectum, somebody just gives a Foley just a little, little bit of pull and you feel a contraction just like the uh, vulvar cavernosis. And the uh, premasteric is for males only. That's stroking the thigh and seeing the uh, uh, testes elevated and stuff like that. So my assumption with my staff and my nurses is that if you find one of these things, I consider that upper monitor on site. And you combine that with the rest of your exam, what you know about neurology, someone who has a C6 injury, with one of these, it's like, start using spousal. Don't do a Don't you find those at the majority of patients, even with Well, it, it depends. Like like Lance said, it depends when you check. You can miss these. These, these are subtle things. And one of my projects, I'm promised my nurses for the last three years, is getting an IRB where we both do independent exam to see if we get the same thing. Well, we exam the same half day. I'll teach them this stuff. They have to do five exams with me and we'll see how well they correlate. I've been talking to a couple other experts out, out there. It's just doing some serial testing with folks and just see what comes back over time with, with the spinal shock. Yeah, well, one discussion yeah. that was done years ago, yeah. Bill Donovan did. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, because they were saying that the, if you didn't have the reoccurrence of upper one, and some of you expected to have an upper one, and I think you could get the results you did, and I, I forgot exactly, but it was something like that, and then if they didn't have it within Quite a long period of time, six months, the majority were early. But if they didn't, I think it was almost all the cases they found a secondary reason why they didn't have the reappearance uh, of the anorectal reflexes, like there had been yeah, other yeah. abdominal injuries, there was a second spinal, yeah. you know, lower spinal injury someplace, there were, you know, a whole list of reasons. It's uh, vascular, the, the, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. The, the other challenge I have at my institution specifically is. Our nurses work uh, 10 hour shifts, seven days, and then have seven days off. So they're there a week, then not a week. And also, we have a fair number of nurses' aides. So some nurses always do their own patient's bowel programs, others don't want to do them. So with that system, I always have to remind them you got to go back and check again. It's not a one time assessment like you admit somebody. You have to go back probably weekly to recheck things and see what's working, not working. There's, yeah. there's, there's a nice chart. Um, I don't know if you've ever read uh, a Spinal Shock Revisited, that um, article that um, Jim Little and John DeTuno uh, did a few years back. It's like 50 pages long. Well, but the, they have a, yeah. a chart in it yeah. um, that that is uh, an, that looks at the the time courses. Some of the reflexes are reflexes that I don't we don't think we even re routinely do, but but those are in there. Okay, so uh, that paper, it's in Nature, it's free. Just Google John DeTuno, Spinal Shock, it'll pop up. It's a really long paper, but it's a review paper and stuff. Uh, but a, a fair amount of that, and John will admit it, was based on consensus, and people still argue about some of the points he made. So we still need some very good design studies on just the physical exam with this. So, so again, I mentioned this earlier, these are nice resources for people, all free. You know, get smart, become a butt expert, like the panel here. <laughs> you know, yeah, I have to look at these things. So yeah. what do you tell patients for how to figure it out once they get home? I mean, well, you're not going to tell them to read a system. Well, I'll, I'll refer to your experts, some of the nurses and the OTs, what, what you tell your patients these days or short stay. Tell them about what? How to manage, how to, manage your how to make the, the decision-making process. Yeah. Something to read when they go home. Of course, a lot of my folks since they have if they have internet access, you just tell them it's free on the internet. Well, yeah, the yes you can, and then all the patient patient guides, the consumer version of the of the clinical practice guidelines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I I think 
Frame my experience with our patients. You know, what works here might not work at home. Hope you paid attention to here and you have problems, call us back. You know, because when people go home, you know, their food's different, at least I hope it is. <laughs> you know, the water's different. And I think the biggest thing is your activity's different. Often in rehab, they're up and down, on off the mat, in and out of bed. At home, all of a sudden, they're up all day, I hope so, or they're in bed all day. You know, and all that affects bowel function, too, like that. So, well, like I said, I hope the food's a little better and different than what I had here and stuff. So, um, teach them how those drugs are working. So, with how, why they're taking each of those drugs and what they're doing for their bowels. Yeah, yeah. So, the stool softeners and the stem how yeah. each of them work. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I, I think to also expound on your question, we have a sense of who is going to be more at risk for problems. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the low, lower moment around people tend to have more problems. Um, and part of this whole bowel management is getting a pre-morbid history too. And I always, I don't sleep exactly, but when somebody has a history of irritable bowel, it's like, oh no. You know, yeah. or, or these folks, uh, yeah, I poo three or four times a day normally. It's like, you know, like chronic constipation. Those are always, always more difficult with that. Uh, when there's no stable home situation, People are dependent for the bowel program. Who's going to do it? You know, nobody's coming forward to do it. It's a last minute thing and stuff. But again, that's, uh, uh, again, experience would tell you who's at risk. But it's all follow up, you know. And I know you guys are not hard credited here. But, uh, I am. Yeah. But w w one of the adjustments CARF has made to be shorter stays is that to be accredited as an inpatient smart birth program, you have Again, in my world, I'm blessed. I got nurse case managers slash nurse educators. And they follow the patients for what I see them. They talk on the phone. And they, they see how they're doing and stuff like that. But it takes a concerted effort because things will change. Most patients actually, you know, they survived without us in the past and most will do in the future. Most people will tend to figure it out. And it's like the old pondering where you have the people who we're ever going to succeed whatever we do. We're resourceful, good families. If people are going to screw up whatever we do, and hopefully there's a nice group in the middle that we really impact and can help. <laughs> no. It's all about that. So. Uh, Denise, you know, it reminds me though that there's project that right. you're Right, we're going to be doing uh, teaching self-management skills. It and won't, it won't be real relevant to the five year, you know, that, or the ones ahead of the five years, which is going to be 250, but right. the other one, you know, but you could look at the having a defined variable of what Bill just said, because I don't think anybody ever has looked at that empirically. And then I would agree very much with Bill that people's pre-injury history of bowel habits, mm -hmm. I mean, how reliable is that of the predictor? We think it all is, but I mean, I don't think anybody's ever looked at that, and you could do that on any depth Correct. Okay. It's right. on Are you one of yeah, yeah, just do something simple, you know, like you said, with two extremes. But one of the things that they are taught in one of the projects is, you know, self-monitoring. And so what types of stuff, signs, symptoms, information should they be monitoring and telling people uh, and then feeding back to their doctor and healthcare oh, yeah. provider? Well, yeah. Hey, Lance. Can, uh, what's that? Doc, Dr. Guess, what do you think about that? Uh, you know, um, are you referring to kind of like the clinical practice guideline review that we That's did? That's that, and also... Uh, how to chart bowel things? Yeah. Uh, is, yeah. is there is there a system for consumers to use, or what you is there something consumers could use to give back to your doctors, or can yeah. they use what you've developed for nurses? So um, yeah, back when I was in Dallas about ten years ago, we that we took we did a multi center VA study and we took um, some of the MCI centers and we took selected guidelines from the DVT guideline and the bowel guideline, mm -hmm. and we looked at provider implementation of the inpatient. As well as the outpatient setting, and um, and one of part of that was for the, on the bowel side was a documentation from the nurses. Mm -hmm. so they did a fantastic job. I was blown away how well the nurses did at actually doing the charting. That, and this was a new tool that was kind of given to them. And so that that tool is is in the literature. Okay. Um, but it's a charting tool. And so they were looking at consistency, volume, those kinds of things. And, um, and you know, and 
when the bowel, when their bowel movements happen and, and what kind of stimulants are used, what, you know, what technique will fit on so these kind of issues and, and charting incontinence and things. So, um, and I think that consistency part is very important, uh, especially. What, of course, whether, and, and how does that correlate with what people are having if they're having incontinence? So is their bowel too hard or too soft? I think people have a lot of difficulty uh, if they're having bowel problems and problems, and they're having a lot of difficulty with managing, modulating their stool consistency. Um, and, uh, you know, whether that's an osmotic thing, uh, if they get into with certain foods, I don't know. So, uh, we, did, we did publish the provider, provider adherence to bowel. Eight years? Yeah. Years ago? Something yeah. like that. Was yeah. or just me? Was that it was well Audrey Nelson was uh, the PI on the project. And um, so we we did a Steve Burns uh, was the first author on the BC and I was the first author on the Royal College papers. Then we did another paper that was related to that where it was uh, looking at people with uh, satisfaction. Mm -hmm. um, the, among veterans, they were folks that went to colostomy there were high rates of dissatisfaction mm -hmm. among the veterans in the So, um, yeah, I, I think modulating mm -hmm. stool consistency is, a, is, a, is so important for our folks because um, they're, they're treading a line where we don't want people to have rough, hard stool. And that, for some folks, seems to be where they tend. Um, and yet we don't want people to have stool that's too soft and they can't, and they, and they have a contest to the stool that's too soft and they eat certain foods. So, um, Linda Drosty in, in Richmond is our, is our new nurse and contest nurse, contest nurse, and, uh, she, uh, you know, you get institutions that have a certain kind of a thing that they do, and so mm -hmm. what we do is we just, um, use a lot of dental fiber, likes to use um, uh, not only the lactobacillus, but if folks are on antibiotics, she likes to use the Saccharomyces the floor store as well um, to, um, uh, to help with the sporing of the floor. Um, there's actually a lot more literature for the Saccharomyces than there is um, for the lactobacillus. Um, and then um, she also likes Banatrol, which is uh, the, the banana, banana flake. Really a sponge. A lot of these fibers are kind of sponges. And so if a person wants to eat pizza and they say, Well, I you know, I, I have diarrhea if I eat pizza, then you know, okay, so you're telling them you load up on you take make sure you're taking your fiber to try to give yourself a little bit more room for error, if you will. A buffer. A buffer. Yeah. So um, but that's a I think that's a tough problem.
That's doing some work with them too, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, the reason I brought the surgeon GI doctors is, um, like a lot of specialties out there, unless they have a, either a special interest or a lot of experience, it's proper to injury they can be really dangerous mm -hmm. and kind of mm -hmm. yeah. you know, And like, like a real common thing, you guys know what the nurses, you know, see a spot of blood on your finger after your bowel program, it's like, duh, you know, that's normal. Anybody else be running to? GI doctors getting scoped and stuff like that, and hemorrhoids, they're a dime a dozen, maybe a nickel a dozen. You, know? <laughs> you have to fix every one of those, and when the, when the doctor doesn't know what's going on, he tries to do a surgical hemorrhoidectomy with their injuries. Yeah. And, you know, go away, go away. You know. And then their blood pressure's 200. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I really have uh, faith that our patients figure a lot of this stuff out. So a real key, again, is what you guys teach them in uh, nursing and also OT, since they also tend to get to hold the dirty end of the stick, too, so to speak. Uh, they're experts with this stuff, too. So teach, teach, teach. But it's, you know, it's, it's often hard in short stays because people just aren't necessarily ready to, to learn and stuff. And psychologically, I still think 95% of people in their first month are all going to be better. They all think they pray enough or try hard enough, work hard enough to walk again and stuff. So it's kind of hard to deal with these really mundane issues, but they're really essential important issues for the rest of their lives. 
will the uh, CBA uh, clinical practice guidelines for the Eugenic Bowel are going to be updated for the next year? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in terms of resource, if you get on the CBA uh, website and hit publications, you need to do a little navigating to find it. But all their clinical practice guidelines are in a PDF form. As long as you put a name in, uh, you can download it for free. So I would suggest mm -hmm. anybody They're here. They're actually going to have an app now. You can get it with your iPhone. Okay. They have so, to pay $15. Dollars. Yeah. What was the easiest? Just get in there. Get just at once. Just download every one of them and stick them in your own personal library. So. And for a lot of the, the practice guidelines, they do have a consumer version too. Yeah. Not yeah. all, but yeah. most of them. With that. The other thing coming up is this class. They're developing the own e-learning center. And they're very ambitious. It covers a thousand topics. And each topic is going to have a, a, a basic and advanced version of it. And so that's being developed now. Um, some modules look really good and others are kind of PowerPoint-ish. But that might be another nice resource for you for those things. I have a question. Yeah. You build a new, like that. Um, you know, I um, most f folks, will, if they go to colostomy, decide they're going to have a colostomy, then they, it, um, I think the thought is that at that point they've given up um, hope of having a timed bowel movement. I wonder if any, have you ever had any folks that tried to still have a timed bowel movement despite having a colostomy by, I don't know, inserting a suppository or something into the ostomy or doing a mini enema? Uh, that kind of thing. Have you ever heard of anything like that? Uh, so there's, there's kind of two questions. Have you heard of it? And the other question is, would it work? Um, any Ever experienced anything like that? I mean, I, I've had a few people with colostomies who have just got that constipated. You know, people have had to do some manual removal through the ostomy uh, with that. Uh, I think I've had a few people we've done retrograde enemas. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've never told someone to do that. Yeah. 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 But most, you know, the, the, it depends on how how high they put the, the colostomy. But uh, they all seem to work well. Although we, we have a younger uh, GI surgeon, and she's scaring people. You know, what? scaring. Oh, and this still might not work. It's like it's not work. <laughs> you know, you tried everything. Go ahead, get it done. You know, so, so, but she, she's been wise enough to ask her more senior I, I guys. Follow your question. Okay. You're saying that are they trying to have a form stool on a well, no. day day basis? <coughs> well, or at, at a regular interval, so that they can. Because I think the, one of the main reasons why somebody would, you know, that people don't want to get a colostomy is the aesthetics. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of the end of the day. yeah. So, but whatever interval stimulate a regular trigger bowel movement, but through an interval. Not that I know of. Not that I know. Who, I, some, I bet some patient is crying. Yeah, I did have a patient. You did? They did do that, but yeah. I, I, can't, I, can't, I didn't know well enough to remember the details of it. It's, because I think that is possible, but it's, it's, very, it's pretty rare. Most of them, they're just using the bag as a casing. Yeah. You know, but they count on not having it be filled very often. So other than the yeah. Plus, I, uh, in answer to that, it depends on where in the colon they make yeah, the stoma. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if it's low, some patients do have an opportunity to have that sort of trained colostomy that empties at a certain time. But it has to be very low in the colon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but usually, I mean, colostomy is a little easier to deal with because uh, if you overshoot medications, it's not, it's not a huge problem. You know, you get too soft and stuff. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Joe. I really appreciate it.